for this? Ready. All right. Hello and welcome, internet friends, to another episode of Defeasible Reasoning. It was a deep uh, dead mouse cut for all you hip cats out there. Uh, produced once again here at the Epic Studios at Grand Rapids Community College Center for Cybersecurity Studies. My name is Professor Andrew Rosema. As an aside, my brother heard one of these and he said, it sounds like you're kind of covering up for not having a PhD. <laughs> and I said, some insecurity. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> you know me too well. Uh-huh. Nobody knows you like your kid brother. Here with my good friend, Noah DeSmit. Hello. Once again. And uh, this, this is your bright idea. You're the, you're the guy who dragged me yeah. in here. So hey. it's kind of the uh, the end of the school year. Um, it's probably going to be our last episode for a little bit. Who knows? Maybe there'll be a couple of summer bonus episodes. Who Ooh. knows? Some special some special ones. You know I'm a 32-week contract employee, right? They don't, they don't actually pay me to come here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So maybe there actually won't be any during the summer, but you'll never know. Keep on your toes. So I thought, you know, we have, we've had a number of, of people come through here. I think about nine or 10 people actually coming here through the school year and heard some great stories, um, origin stories and uh, other things from them about their experience and uh, around computer security. But the one story that we have not heard is Drew Rosamas. Uh, so I thought it might be kind of cool to just kind of hear about how you got into all of this and why you're here, why you're doing this. Um, I thought maybe our, you know, tens and tens of dozens of listeners might be interested in to hear that. You know, when I left the house this morning, I said to my wife, I think no one wants to talk about me. And she goes, oh, well, this will be your favorite day then, won't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Best day ever. Yeah. Let's <laughs> talk about me. Uh, yeah, I'm not uh, known for being overwhelmingly shy about that stuff. Yeah, um, no, that's all right. So I was born, I grew up, okay, I became a man. Good, and I liked computers. All right, well, that's that it. Great. Thanks, guys. Mm-hmm. See ya. No. Um, yeah. So, did you? One thing that I was interested in actually was because I know you talked about growing up in the South Side. So did, did you grow up here in Grand Rapids? Then? Mad Ave. <laughs> Shout out to Madison Avenue. Uh, yeah. Yep. Uh, born and raised in the hardcore streets of uh, West Michigan. Actually, uh, born, spent a hot minute in beautiful uh, Muskegon, Michigan, where my oh, old okay. man was a programmer for AT&T for a spell. Um, oh, really? Indeed. Um, and then... Yeah. What, what did he do? What did your dad and mom do? My mother is a psychiatric nurse and my father did a stint as a programmer, but was uh, primarily a psychiatric patient, which worked out well for my mother and father's <laughs> relationship. So um, gotcha. it was tough. His, his, my old man had a struggle uh, with, with mental health. So I am sure. intimate with that community. And my mom uh, was a psych nurse, which uh, really was weird. Sometimes my dad would wind up like committed at the hospitals she was working at. It was awkward. Uh, Not how they met. They met in high school, but yeah, for a while there, my first uh, trip to GRCC as a student, I thought I wanted to be a psych student. And then I discovered that nobody knew what they were talking about in that field. (laughs) (laughs) Cause you had grown up with it. And (laughs) so like, like, um, so here's a, here's a, here's what I hearken it to, to many uh, studies, particularly of, of, um, like the theory of mind and of, uh, what we know about what we are. When I was a kid, we had an Atari Mm -hmm. and if I flicked the on and off switch a lot on the Atari, I could get it to glitch. And then like you could have Galaga, but then like the video component of the, of the software would be all jacked up mm-hmm. and your Galaga ship would have extra blocks on it and stuff and weird things would happen because you've, you've caused a glitch, right? Like after a couple of psych courses, I was like, this is kind of where we're at with psychology. We've sort of figured out like parts of how the human mind works and how that relates to the human brain, but we're kind of just flipping the switches on here and seeing mm-hmm. what glitches happen. Now I could write you Galaga. Like I understand f- fundamentally, it would take me many years for sure. But like, I understand how the, how the electricity on the wire works and how from that all the way up to how the video game would happen. Like, like th- those things are knowable. And I just don't think we're there with psychology. And that just freaked me out. I was like, yeah, I could not possibly. It's very this. nebulous. Yeah. And, uh, you know, not to throw throw shade, but like they've got this huge reproducibility crisis going on in that discipline where there's all these great studies and then somebody comes back through and they're working on a PhD and they don't have a great idea for new research. So what they decide to do instead is to try to a replication study. And it turns out something like more than half of the studies, Oh wow! especially like the really famous ones. Yeah. Maybe we can't reproduce that. That whole marshmallow thing you heard about mm, hard to do that whole prisoner experiment. Mm, maybe it's hard to reproduce. Right. So uh, that whole thing concerned me. So like kind of turned me off to, um, the academic endeavor entirely for a while there. 
So like I said, I was born. Uh, the question you inevitably get in these kind of things is like, hey, what was your first computer, man? And like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and no end of very boring conversations stem from that initial question. Sure, yeah. But like my old man gave me um, a, re they were re retiring a data processor and I don't even know, like model, I'm, I'm to this day, I, I don't concern myself with model numbers or things a whole lot, but like it was this um, basically typewriter, hmm. but it had an LCD screen hmm. that you could, you could type your sentence mm -hmm. and then human like verify the sentence was what you wanted to type and then hit the enter key and it was <laughs> printed out like probably on thermal paper or something. It was, it was horrible, but it was, it was like cool and fun and had like when I typed the arrow key and then I typed a bunch of minuses after it. I, look, I made a spaceship go across that screen. <laughs> like, so, yeah. How old were you when oh, man, you started I, messing with that? This is probably like four or five, six. Oh, know? really? It's yeah. Pretty young. And it, like, I'm an old ass man. So like that yeah. was, the, that was cutting edge at the time. And then, yeah, I was the kid who took apart the phones and, and that kind of stuff. My first like real computer though, was a Commodore 64 that my mom had a friend who had a kid who was kind of into the hacking bulletin board scene. So like my very first computer came with all these wares, mm -hmm. this, this maybe not entirely legitimate collection of just five and a quarter inch floppy disk after floppy disk after floppy disk. It's just all sorts of stuff for me to explore. So I spent the next year and a half just tearing through things. And that was back in the days when you could, you could take any program you had and, and hack it. You could just like open up the code and then you could, we had a wonderful time making a game of a uh, monopoly. Mm -hmm. Like we replaced all the words with swear words and stuff. Cause we were so cool. <laughs> <laughs> Probably eight or nine at the time. And it seemed like, well, really I was going to ask if you ever got into, uh, <clears throat> if you ever got into any, uh, trouble with all of that tinkering when you were younger nothing that i care to admit to on a podcast <laughs> okay the, the cool thing about um this line of work is that uh i've never been arrested for anything computer related okay well, i that's, plan on keeping it that that's way that's a positive till i die yeah <laughs> and statues of limitations on things uh have have varying expirations so i go back and forth i feel like um throwing around your gnome de hack mm -hmm. is uh a little silly as an adult but i i get that like people who grew out of that scene um still cling on to that but like i always thought like the purpose of doing that of having one of those was like so that you could throw it away hmm. like you don't want to get like i have a bunch of old bbs identities that if i said that name was me like it would make sense to you, you know, oh i see what you did there but like hopefully nobody's looking up the absolute idiocy that i spouted <laughs> out when i was 16 and connected yeah. to a modem anonymously right no for sure yeah sa same same with me i mean i i remember being uh in high school when sort of i'm sure message boards were around uh way before that but they were a little more ubiquitous and accessible for the average person uh when i was in high school and man i i'm i'm just hoping that a lot of those message boards are just like wiped from, from the well, internet. Darcy Swope used to run one of the boards I um, hang out on and she is now here at the college uh, as an analyst or something like that. She and I think her husband at the time um, ran one of the boards that like we played the games on mm. and would log in every day to do stuff way back in. Yeah. Did you, did you like high school? Oh no, I hated high school. Yeah. I absolutely hated it. I'm, um, I didn't, like, where did I, you go to high school? Well, mostly I, I sometimes attended Ottawa Hills high school. <laughs> okay. That's right. Ottawa Hills. Ottawa Hills. I, I so. was, uh, so I went to Immaculate Heart of Mary and, and in like the computer vein, I was part of the first, they spent some money on computers. They bought, um, a, a Commodore 64 lab. So I got to be like the lab. Immaculate Heart of Mary? Yep. Right across the street from Ottawa. So okay. like my, the first, you know, 12 years of my educational experience were within walking distance of one another and worlds apart too, because sure. IHM is on the border of East Grand Rapids. And if our listeners aren't familiar with the layout of Grand Rapids, it's kind of the rich kid neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So it was sort of the rich kid Catholic school. And I was most definitely not a rich kid. <laughs> so, um, but they had, they were did. you Catholic? Did you grow up Catholic? I did. Um, I'm recovering the, but, um, <laughs> but they educated the hell out of me. I mean, they, they really had exceptional teachers who taught me to think, which was kind of probably the reason I'm a recovering Catholic. I'm not a Catholic. They should have put religion class in front of science class as opposed to the other way around. <laughs> Cause I walked right. into religion class with some questions. I'm like, uh, now, now wait a minute. Hold on. I just heard. Yeah. So Mr. Bergman back there <laughs> just told me that like water, you, you, you can't stand on it. 
and I've been checking this out in my right. own experiments at home and I tried it. Yeah. <laughs> this doesn't work. So, um, so yeah, so I went to IHM, they had a computer lab and like I, I was the kind of the chubby kid who uh, got to stay in from lunch and play in the computers if he behaved himself. Okay. <laughs> so we, we had, um, like Commodores and I don't know. I, yeah, I think that's pre 286, 386 kind of stuff that didn't show up till high school. I had a computer in high school. My parents couldn't afford to get me a computer in high school. And that's all I'm going to say about that. Okay. But I had a sweet ass <laughs> laptop and so like okay. kind of continued to hang out on the scene and kept my head down and, and knew about attribution and right. how, how not to get uh, into too much trouble. Uh, so, so when you, then you finished high school, you, after, after you had finished high school, you, um, well, that's the thing. attended GRCC. I attended GRCC before I finished high school. Oh really? Because I was involved in one of the early, like middle college, um, early college things. They taught a business class there. So I actually started GRCC. I started college. I stopped college. I started college. I stopped college. I eventually got an associate's degree, but it took me like 10 years because mm -hmm. in the meantime, what was going on is I had a job at the mall. The job at the mall led to a job at, um, this place called computer city right across the street from the mall. And I went and worked there and sold computers when computers were like a high dollar value thing. So in, like a big sale was like $3,500, $4,500 yeah. in printer and monitor and computer. And like that was a huge investment for people back in the day. Yeah. I remember that. The first computer that we ever got in our house, my dad brought home a gateway, a gateway 3000. And it, I think he spent like three grand on it. And, yeah. And, it wasn't cheap. Yeah. It's crazy. <clears throat> and so... Um, from that though, I sort of fell sideways into like, they're like, this kid's kind of bright and he can, uh, he's doing a fine job as a salesperson, but we need somebody to manage the, what was called the upgrade and, um, and corporate sales counter. So it, it was like, they had a bunch of technicians who would put RAM in your computer, replace your hard drive, put a new video card in that kind of thing and assist the corporate sales people when they would make a big corporate sale. So like one of the jobs I had was, um, they sold all the computers to Aquinas's math department one year. Oh, wow. So one summer I sat in the, um, basement of the math building at Aquinas and unboxed and helped set up 90 computers, something like that. You wow. know, several classrooms worth of computers. Yeah. Um, that are still there today. <laughs> no, 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 no. Aquinas is a fine institution. Yeah. They do wonderful work over there. Just they, kidding. they've had me back since uh, <laughs> to do a little consulting work. Um, but so, yeah, so I, I kind of went from high school to college really fast and then sort of into the world of work and saw how computers wound up like actually being of benefit to businesses and how mm. they actually worked. And I'm sort of an enterprising lad. So yeah. I was, I've, I have always had a side hustle. Like I had a consulting business the day I got back there at the, um, at the back of the, the corporate sales gig, they were always like, Hey, if you know, we needed somebody to come out and look at this, that, and the other thing could, could we do that? And so like, I, I called myself wired arts and had some cards printed up and it was basically like, I'll do any computer thing you need done kind of mm -hmm. business. The problem with those is like sales is tough and it's a lot of work and you don't really want to invoice people cause you didn't get into computers so that you could be an accountant. So I was never great <laughs> at that. Um, marrying an accountant was the smartest thing I ever did for mm -hmm. that. But it, it introduced me to like a bunch of attorneys. So I wound up doing like some interesting forensic and legal work. It was kind of the wild west in the like mid and late nineties. And, and this is all during the 10 year period of like on and off again with yeah. college. Yeah. It, and it was like, nobody cared what your degree looked like if, if you appeared to be competent in front of a computer. And what were you, what were you going for at GRCC while all this was happening to you? I am a, a, a proud owner of one of the fine 007 degrees that the college is okay. discontinuing. And it, it is an associate of arts period full stop. Okay. So yeah. like you took 60 some credit hours, you met the MTA requirements. I remember I had to take a lab science and I hadn't done, so this is uh, boy, what? Oh, three or something like that. I hadn't done math in forever. And the only one that was available was like, um, physics with a lab <laughs> and I'm like, ah, no problem. I can do that. And like day one, he hands you this, this calculus and trigonometry refresher. And I had never taken calc or trig. And he's like, if you do not understand the material in here, this is, uh, uh, Dr. Wang over in the, the okay. science department. If you do not have the math skills to be successful, just got crushed, had oh, to teach yeah. myself trig and, and, and like, calc one and two while I'm trying to do this physics class, but got through it. Um, 
so it was just sort of like the catch-all. I was focused on computer stuff and yeah. some arts stuff. So I did like a graphics class. I did a, a film appreciation class that came up really handy when I wound up um, working in television, having to like deal with shot composition and stuff like that and run oh, the production yeah. department. It was like, no, I've never done anything that like related to what I studied until I started teaching it. So that was Ottawa, got me into CC, sort of studied everything, but it was the yeah. real world work that was, that was the interesting stuff. You know, when you were doing your like consulting and then working, yeah. working for the, and, and like city. going to, to like installing, uh, computers and businesses and doing the consulting work. I got to do like early forensic analysis kind of stuff, incident response, things like that. You know. Well, that's the thing, like, you know, installing computers and helping people with, you know, computer problems is one thing, but like the security side of it, you know, that, um, this podcast is about obviously, but also you're, I think, heavily involved in, in, in the security community. How did the security component of computers come into your, your field of vision? Well, so that's the, the consulting for lawyers part. Okay. Um, I, um, I, I, you know, like I was saying back in the nineties, it was, it was the wild, wild west. So like if you needed somebody to do forensic analysis on a computer, or if you needed somebody to do um, installing a hard drive. There was like no differentiation between those two skill sets at that point. They're just like, ah, those guys know about computers. They can do that. <clears throat> yeah. So that's, that's how I got thrown into like the, the sort of incident response, uh, side of the world and then and like forensics analysis stuff. I have had stuff I found when cases that were worth millions of dollars and I charged like $500 for the work I did and later had the attorneys tell me, you know, if you'd slapped a zero or two on the end of that bill, nobody had batted an eye. And I'm like, no, no, you tell me. So, <laughs> but again, I wasn't, I wasn't like great at like running a small business, which is essentially what you're doing in that line of work. Yeah. So one of the uh, businesses I was doing that for was XMI here in town, which was at the time oh, okay. like, privately. That's how you got connected to XMI was That's... first doing the, some computer stuff. Yep. I, um, I supported their Stratus nonlinear editing system. Okay. Yeah. For people who don't know, or who may not be from West Michigan, a Fox affiliate here in West Michigan, Fox 17 WXMI. So this was way back in the day before they were even... Uh, they were, oh, were, they were they not a Fox they affiliate? Were, they were affiliated. Oh, okay. But um, <clears throat> the I, when I was consulting for them, yeah, Stratus, garbage. It was like this uh, Mac connected to some very proprietary video processing gear, which was a lot of like take the board out and put the board back in and make it better kind of stuff. Mm. It was no fun. And troubleshooting Mac still a pain. But um, so they needed um, somebody to come on full time because the the deal was the people who owned the, the business were getting rid of it because Fox had said, you must be offering a news product if you're going to retain your affiliation. Okay. That was kind of a gun to the head to the local affiliates that they were going to need to make this huge investment. So they couldn't do that. Tribune Media was looking to acquire stations and they were like, okay, well, we'll buy, the, as part of buying the station, you guys are going to have to like get a for realsies IT professional in there. And so they were kind of like, hey, we've got a guy. And so... They uh, interviewed me. I remember at the time I was working at, I had um, been recruited from Computer City over to the Gateway Country Store. Do you remember that? 28th Street. Yes. East Island. Um, working in, I do remember that. That might be where your old man got his computer. Maybe. Uh, and I was working in the tech department there, kind of same kind of thing, troubleshooting motherboards, blah, 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 and still kind of working my side hustle. And they called me up. I remember interviewing in that parking lot with um, this gentleman from Chicago. He was quizzing me on the seven layer OSI model and stuff like that. And mm -hmm. like, luckily again, I had taken enough kind of computer classes that I was familiar with the topic. I was also a big slash dot reader. So I remembered a funny joke about the seven layer OSI model as compared to the seven layer burrito from Taco Bell. <laughs> the classic comparison. Mm -hmm. And then <laughs> I wound up at XMI, which kind of got me into this big tribune at the time was multinational. They sold off their multinational stuff, but they still like, I I was there when they, you know, they, they were as big as like 42 CV stations at one point. They own the LA times, they own the Chicago Tribune, they own the, um, hmm. the, uh, WPIX in New York was one of their big stations. They own the super station WGN in Chicago. So they owned the Cubs for a while. So I, I've actually seen Cubs games from like the suites. Oh, wow. Kind of a cool perk. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was, it was an awesome place to work and it had a huge like vertical. You could go like do whatever you know, you wanted to do, there was networking to be done. And then, so as part of working for those guys, the Sasser and, um, Melissa virus and the, I love you viruses, all those things kind of hit. And most businesses and tribute included, I think was hit pretty flat footed. 
and they were kind of like, man, we need somebody who knows something about like a, comu- a computer virus they got hit by. Right. And, and well, they were worms and viruses and, and like nobody was doing a ton of thinking about how to do security, right? Preemptively for the company. <clears throat> right. And, and, um, you know, system patching was in its infancy and nobody was sort of thinking about how to do this. And so when they were talking about like, well, we probably should develop this talent internally. Um, there was a SANS Institute who you've probably heard us talk about here Mm -hmm. class offered in Grand Rapids and the, the CIO guy at the time from Chicago, like kind of tapped me on the shoulder and said, and he'd come out and like met all the IT people. And he was like, you know what, you're a pretty bright young whippersnapper. You should check out this SANS Institute stuff. And it was the first time I'd done anything like specifically focused on, um, sort of what we now call like red team, blue team type security. Like right. I'd, I'd been doing the forensic stuff and, you know, analyzing systems and patching systems and stuff like that is, is sort of like good systems administrator work. Um, but now we call it blue team work, which makes it only slightly sexier. And um, so creating, um, like just getting into the, like those early, um, it's like this is the, the nascent uh, industry that will become the current security industry way back then. It was uh, a lot of like password stuff and how you can break all the passwords out of it. Like at the time it was windows NT days and, and you could basically reverse all the passwords out of a password hash pretty easily. And like, I was, I saw all this stuff and I was like, dear God, <laughs> <laughs> what morons we are. None of us are safe. <laughs> and and seriously, like, I spent the next two months after that class, like we changed every password and mm-hmm. we, we did a bunch of corporate policy and stuff. And that's kind of what wow. got me fired up. And then like uh, I, I did some uh, various works in corporate land and relevant to security, I, I got to this point in my career where I was like, man, I'm doing pretty good, but I have an associate's degree. And if I want to change jobs at some point, and you know, at this point I'm, I'm a grown up, I've got kids and responsibilities mm-hmm. and a mortgage and, and stuff. And you're still in Grand Rapids. Yeah. And, and I, you know, they, they, I did road warrior stuff for a while. Okay. And for uh, Tribune. Yep. Sort of thought about moving to, um, they had a couple of jobs in Chicago, but at the time, um, my wife owned a trucking company, which is completely random and another story, but it was a big enough deal that we decided we would stay in town. So I, they just hoteled me out of GR when they wanted me to go to, like I helped K, um, KSWB in San, San Diego, like build out their automation system and stuff like that. So, so like I got to, you know, see the the world through the inside of a tv studio which yeah. is always the same <laughs> it's always yeah. kind of a drab beigey mm-hmm. building with a fun yeah. and hip sales department and production control rooms and stuff like that so like as i looked around though if i wanted to make the same kind of money i was making at tribune anywhere else i was not going to get a foot in the door mm. without like without a, a bachelor's degree it just wasn't going to happen broadcast engineers are notoriously not wonderful networking people mm-hmm. so it's not like there's not exactly happening chatty bunch yeah as as someone who's worked worked in tv for about five years before my current job um all of the engineers that i met at the tv stations yeah i wouldn't imagine them as anyone that that, that could that could help me or want to be helpful to anyone <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a horrible horrible thing i know some very lovely broadcast engineers but um the, uh, the, like I was one of the first crop of people managing that kind of stuff who came up with this sort of it background, you know, there was only so much it and I would separate that from computer science, but like it focused information systems, integration kind of, um, like real research on like, like I had taken classes where we talked about systems analysis and I was the first crop of kind of people in that role who, who had done that. Um, as opposed to coming from like electrical engineering backgrounds that used to be very relevant when you were like resoldering blown capacitors on tape decks. But as that business turned more into automating video playback systems on computers, it fell out of that sort of old school world and into mine. And, and I was just kind of right place, right time um, for that. Yeah. But it, it, it made me know that like you know, the, the little bit of security work I was doing was cool and, and like helping making policy is fun, I guess. But eventually you get to this place where you're really just kind of like pushing spreadsheets and writing policy and and Mm that's not so great. So when I thought about like, what would I want to do as, um, I needed, I needed a bachelor's degree. Yeah. It needed to be in something computer E. Um, it didn't need to be computer science. It didn't need to be programming focused. Um, 
there were these new crop of institutions that were part of the Center of Academic Excellence by the NSA and the CNSS. It is the thing that, that made me feel comfortable going after an online degree. I was like, if the federal government has signed off on this degree program, I think I can feel pretty good about taking it. So yeah. I, I looked at a couple of them. Capella in Minnesota had an all online program that uh, took many, not all of my college credits uh, because we used to offer a lot of two credit classes. That's another thing we fixed in that department. Um, and uh, the rest was history. I, I got to do really interesting work with those guys. Uh, so you did Capella then? Yep, for, okay. my, for my bachelor's degree. Well, then I got out of there and I'm still not entirely sure why I did this, but I wanted a sort of like a better brand name on my resume. And I hate to, to reduce education to basically brand names and certifications yeah. on your resume. But I feel like it's a legitimate thing to do. Sorry, educator friends. Um, <laughs> and so I, I, I hunted around for like, where's the best master's program I could get into? And there's a bunch of great ones out there now. So if you've got a bachelor's degree and are thinking about doubling down, um, I went to Boston University, awesome school, gave Martin Luther King his freaking PhD. They're, they're a yeah. great, great school. And, uh, the only and it was it all, all online? Yep. The only time <clears throat> I set foot on campus was I made my wife go with me to graduate and I made her spend the night with me in the dorms. <laughs> And she's never forgiven me for that. That's and I'm funny. not allowed to make travel arrangements anymore. <laughs> but so like, um, I think I did that because I was still kind of on this, like I will become a vice associate vice president of information technology kind of thing. Uh, like live in that corporate rat like race life. And, um, yeah, uh, could, uh, but I don't think I missed a thing to be honest mm. with you. Um, so what got you then? turned from or not turned but sort of <laughs> what brought what, you to the dark side <laughs> what changed so that you were kind of more focused on this uh drew rosema as an educator idea sasha petrovic okay sasha petrovic take linux 2 uh, at grcc and Sasha Petrovic was the um, a, a wicked smart dude who got a bad rap because um, he was a Bosnian refugee. So spoke excellent English for someone who learned it as an adult, um, but not great English. And I think got like like not a lot of people recognized really how like smart this guy was. And hmm. I promoted him when he was at Fox to running their master control when the position oh, yeah. opened up, and he was taking a Linux class and. Uh, came to me and kept asking for like help and I'm pretty handy with the Linux. So I, uh, I was tutoring him and I tutored him and I tutored him and he goes, you know what? They tell me they don't have adjunct faculty who can teach this. And I remember seeing that you got your master's degree. Have you thought about maybe teaching a class or two over there? And, uh, except he, you got to imagine him saying it in like a really cool Bosnian accent. Right? Yeah. <laughs> He's very cool. Yeah. Um, he's cool. Uh, he, uh, he, he gave me a pen when I left that I treasure to this day. Cool. Um, but yeah, so he, he told me to go adjunct. I met with uh, then department chair, Tim Coates. He set me up. I think the first class I taught here was like Microsoft Access or something. And it was kind of a good way to like get your feet wet because Access is sort of like half, here's where the buttons are and half, this is how databases work. Mm. So it was kind of a cool way to, to get my feet wet. And I did, a, I think I taught JavaScript one time for him and um, another crack at the old Access. And then the full-time faculty position were opened up and they was like, and we're kind of hoping you could focus on security. And I'm like... I'm your man. That's I've awesome. I've been doing this for a while now. Yeah. And so, yeah, the rest is history. I, 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 you know, the, the things that I sort of set my sights on when I came here were we added the Cisco networking Academy and equipment to create a, a lab so we could do hands on networking. And, um, the lab included virtual machines so that, uh, we were, we were like doing a lot of depending on other people to host services for us that really you can kind of host yourself these days. So, um, so now students can, you know, do their own virtual machines on their systems or use our net lab to do them. This is kind of like a thing that's gone to the cloud in the last couple of years too, though. And then we, we changed the curriculum around to comply with the, those standards that, um, are set out by the, the national security agency and the center for national security studies, the NSA CNSS brought to you by the department of Homeland security and NSA. And so, um, we realigned the curriculum so that it focused on those things. There was hmm. already a security program that had been started by one of my predecessors and, um, so it was just a matter of realigning that, continuing the good work that had already been begun, but with kind of a more focused mm. um, uh, goal of, of checking all the boxes that the, the NSA is looking for and using that as a guideline for what constitutes a good program and then getting it certified. Yeah. That's the thing we did. So now at Grand Rapids Community College, um, 
teaching young minds <laughs> do uh, you <laughs> some of the young minds man uh, i don't know if you know the demographics of this place some of those young minds are like in their mid 30s yeah no i know yeah we're we're we do we have a lot of non-traditional students but i think the number 70 percent ish so like the majority of <laughs> is our, it really yeah the majority of our students are non-traditional interesting do you ever find yourself sort of missing pre-educator days or, or is this sort of like what what you really have found that you enjoy doing hmm uh you know occasionally uh, I will find myself doing consulting work. Um, so like, like I said, I'm, I've always kind of had an entrepreneurial bent. So if I hear, um, somebody's got an interesting, uh, the, the last example I can bring up is, uh, it's tax season. And, uh, mm -hmm. I was, I was brought in just kind of very hands offish to just kind of provide some guidance, but it's interesting to hear like what's going on in the really real world. Um, as opposed to, um, you know, the ivory tower thing. So I feel mm -hmm. like we do our best particularly at this institution when we still kind of keep a hand in right um, no yeah i agree so like actually hearing um you know how people are getting owned like in the in the real world uh the last one i was consulting had to do with somebody getting tricked by an email hmm. routing numbers went to the wrong bank next thing you know the money's missing um that kind of stuff which is still kind of what i was doing you know in the 90s when i was doing incident response before we called it that it, at the time it was, Hey man, I think our web server got hacked. I think can you, something happened. Can you help me figure this out? <laughs> and like, have you heard of the dot history file? The what? <laughs> <laughs> um, so it, it was, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's still kind of more of that. Do I want to go, but you know, man, like not having a nine to five kind of an amazing mm. life change. Yeah. Um, and being like paid to wallow in, the discipline is amazing. Like mm. I get why people are interested in being academics because from morning to night, even if I'm working on something, it never really feels like I'm working on something. You know, mm. if I'm, uh, I'm, I've, I've gone back to the Sands Institute. They've since become an accredited, um, confer of master's degrees. So kind of for funsies and because the institution likes to pay for faculty to keep their skills updated and fresh, I'm kind of working on a second master's degree. Oh, just cool. Sort of because, yeah. um, and I'm having a blast with it and it doesn't feel like work. Also, most IT gigs have at least some on-call rotation involved. Not doing that has been pretty sweet too. So yeah, the on-call can be, I, I don't have any experience with it in, in regards to like computer security, but I, when I worked in TV, uh, um, when there was breaking news or severe weather, oh, yeah. you had to be on call to come in and my wife, you know, works at the hospital. She's always on call. So yeah, definitely not having a, that, uh, that on call is nice. It, it helps you work out that whole work-life balance thing. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, gives you time to do your podcast. Right. Which is pretty sweet. The most important component of your job now. I think so. I, I would say. Cranking out the podcast. <laughs> Well, cool. I mean, obviously, I'm sure there's a lot more. I'm trying to distill it down to, to, to your, to your the, story. The, the salient uh, points, particularly the ones that you know don't have any sort of salacious, salacious material yeah. down on them. <laughs> well, anything um, you'd like to leave with our again tens and dozens of listeners before the, we before we take a break for the summer. <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I, um, I would welcome any feedback. I have heard some things about the pod from people just walking around, which is pretty cool. Mostly from my friends who hang out in the InfoSec community around West Michigan. Mm -hmm. So, um, I would love any thoughts on where you would like to see this go. Mm. So is the interview thing working for you? Would you prefer that we do more Drew and Noah one-on-ones and, and kind of look at topics? Mm. One of the ideas I have been um, thinking about is now that we sort of have a cast of characters of friends in the industry around town, yeah. maybe we take a more focused look on the things they're expert at. I'd love to ask Dr. DeMott what it's like to run a business in InfoSec. I think I'd love to mm. talk to Matt about what it is to be a hacker. And that dude seemed deep there seems like more to be plumbed there yeah um, and then we could spill more coffee on the table which we edited out of this episode <laughs> he'll live that down <laughs> atlas we love you so so that's what i'm thinking so uh, please hit us up on the twitters or me on the linkedins most uh, of my of my socialing happens there um myspace lost all mm -hmm. of my data <laughs> from like 2002 to 2015 or something so i guess you'll never hear my awesome um grunge metal band that I had put together and had the MySpace page for. Dang. Sorry about that, friends. That's it. I thank you for asking me about me 
as, as, <laughs> as my wife likes to point out my yeah. favorite topic. Of <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. No problem. I was interested. So thanks, cool, man. You know what we're, we're going to have to close out the next season with? Hmm. We're going to have to find out a little bit. About Ooh, it has nothing to do with computer security though. Yeah, that's all right. Well, maybe not nothing, but very little. There you go. All right. And thanks again for listening to this, yet another episode of Defeasible Reasoning. Perhaps this one should be Defeasible Reminiscing. <laughs> defeasible Reminiscing. I like it. <laughs> See you guys. Defeasible Reasoning is produced at the Epic Studios of Grand Rapids Community College Media Technologies Department. Epically executive produced by Noah D. Smith and hosted by me, Drew Rose. Thank you.